What's up guys, how's it going? My name is Matt Donovan and I'm a travel and landscape photographer based in Sydney, Australia. I've been shooting professionally now for about six years, working mainly in the tourism industry, traveling all over the world and Australia, capturing images for their social media and marketing usage. I've been lucky enough to travel to some pretty incredible locations, uh, some of which you would have seen on the screen right now. Uh, but if you wanna see more of my work, uh, head over to Instagram and you can find me at It's Worth a Shot or on my website and blog, itsworthashot.com. In this video, I'm gonna take you through a fairly common workflow practice of mine to edit one of my photos in Affinity Photo. Uh, I say common because things can get pretty advanced in the landscape editing world, uh, but I'm gonna keep this one nice and simple so people of all levels can follow along. Um, even if you're an advanced user of Affinity Photo, please stick around because there might be something you learn anyway. So I'm sure you don't wanna hear me ramble on any further, so let's head over to Affinity Photo and get started. This is the image we'll be working on today. It's a scene from a very photogenic coastal region of New South Wales. It's had some minor raw adjustments made with exposure balancing between the sky and foreground, but apart from that, it's pretty much straight out of camera. As you can see, this is quite the vivid sunrise. So the first thing I do once I'm in Affinity Photo is remove or diminish any obvious distracting elements. I do this to clean up the image and keep the focus on the main subjects. In this image, that is most of the elements around the central third of the scene. So the crashing waves, the towering basalt columns, and the vivid reds in the sky. For this, I find the best tool to use is the in-painting brush. I keep it set at pretty much its default settings. Uh, it's important to keep the hardness of the brush reasonably high as you'll start to create some unwanted effects if the brush is too soft. But well, that can definitely depend on the textures you are painting over top of. And you also want to make sure the source for the in-painting brush is set to current layer and below. We're now going to create a new blank pixel layer. Uh, then it's honestly as simple as painting over the areas you want to remove from the image and letting Affinity Photo do all of the hard work for you. I'll speed up this part of the tutorial because it's no doubt one of the most boring and tedious parts of the whole process, but you'll get an idea of just how much removing the smallest of details can help clean up the image overall. Okay, so the next thing we'll be doing to this image is darkening the sky. And like most editing software, there is an abundance of ways to achieve that in Affinity Photo. However, my favorite and probably one of the cleanest methods is to use a luminosity mask. Now these can get incredibly complicated really quickly, but luckily today we'll only be using a very basic luminosity mask. The short explanation about luminosity masks or channels, if you're not already familiar with them, is they are a way of selecting pixels within an image based on their luminosity value. The beauty of luminosity masks is that they are perfectly feathered based on existing tones in the image and require much less work than if you were to create uh, a selection using the selection brush tool or painting in your own mask with a soft brush, for example. This might sound a little confusing at first, but it's best to just dive right in and see how they work visually. It's worth noting, if you're a somewhat advanced user of Affinity Photo, you may prefer to use the layers blend ranges settings instead of traditional luminosity masks. To create a luminosity mask, we need to make sure the channel studio is visible. Head up to view, studio, and select channels. Now we can click through each channel to see which channel best separates the sky from the landscape. In this scene, you can see the cleanest contrast within the blue channel. Because we wanna make that channel a mask of a curves adjustment, we need to first make a selection of the channel. You can do this by right-clicking on the chosen channel and selecting load to pixel selection. Now you'll see a bunch of marching ants that are selecting more or less the brighter pixels in the blue channel. Keeping in mind, uh, the marching ants don't give the best representation of what is actually being selected. With that selection active, we'll head to the adjustments layer and create a new curves adjustment. And we're going to create a darkening curve targeted slightly towards the brightest pixels of the image, like so. If I toggle that layer's visibility, you can see that it has more or less only affected the brighter pixels within the image because of that mask that is now applied to the adjustment. However, you might also notice that it's having an effect on the water as well, and I really don't want that. To remedy this, we'll just pop the curves adjustment layer inside a group, 
Create a mask on that group and with the gradient tool, just hide the effect of the curves in the lower portion of the image, making sure the gradient doesn't negate the original luminosity mask too much. And let's just dab a little bit of black on this mask over the wave so it doesn't darken that area either. So that's darkened the sky overall, but now I want to add a little bit of additional darkening just to the upper portion of the sky. That's uh, as simple as creating another curves layer, bringing down the curve line like so, and using the gradient tool again just to restrict the curve to the top of the image. Now we can group all those layers together to keep things organized and call it something like sky darkening. Before we move on to the next section, again, if luminosity masking is new to you, it's definitely worth spending some time learning about them in greater depth. They are honestly one of the most powerful ways to create selections and adjust specific values and even colors of your image. As I mentioned earlier, it's also worth looking into blend ranges within Affinity Photo 2, as they can produce similar results and may be easier for some to learn. So now I've covered the most tedious task, blemish removal, and the most complicated task, sky darkening, it's all smooth sailing from here on out, I promise. Now it's time to add a little bit of depth to the scene by creating some haze or atmosphere to the distant rocks on the right side of the image. This is as simple as creating a blank pixel layer, selecting the color picker tool, uh, the keyboard shortcut is I, then sampling a color from the warm highlights in the sky, then hitting B on the keyboard to switch to the brush tool, and with a really soft and fairly large brush, paint in a little bit of haze where it's appropriate. Obviously this looks ridiculous as is, so we can switch the blend mode to screen and lower the opacity until it looks less ridiculous. And then boom, we have a touch of somewhat realistic haze. Next, I want to increase the saturation, particularly in the warm colors. My personal favorite way to do this on images with fiery skies like these is to create a channel mixer adjustment and adjust only the red output, like so. Increasing the red to 120% and reducing the other two to negative 10%. It's important to keep all the RGB values totaling exactly 100%, otherwise you'll start introducing the excessive color as a tint to the image, which you may want, but for this image, I definitely don't. Basically, what this is doing is only increasing the saturation of the red channel and feathering off the saturation to the other colors, similarly to how luminosity masks affected mostly the brighter pixels and feathered out its intensity to the darker pixels. This next technique is probably the most popular amongst landscape photographers and is also the most commonly overdone and overused technique, in my opinion, the Orton effect. Without getting into the history of the Orton effect, it basically adds a nice overall glow to the image if done correctly. This is my way of going about it, however there are multiple ways to achieve this effect or similar. Firstly, we need to merge all of our existing layers into their own new layer. Uh, to do this, simply select the topmost layer and use the keyboard shortcut Command Option Shift E on a Mac or Control Alt Shift E on Windows. Alternatively, you can go up to Layer and down to Merge Visible. Now all the layers and adjustments we've made up until this point exist on a brand new layer. Now with our new layer selected, we need to blur the layer by going to Filters, Blur, Gaussian Blur, and selecting the appropriate radius. I find the resolution of your camera to be a good ballpark, then you can adjust from there to taste. This image was shot with a 36 megapixel sensor, so I'm going to choose somewhere around 36. Again, this isn't a rule set in stone, it's more of a guideline. Also, the image I've supplied along with this tutorial is a smaller resolution, so you'll have to eyeball the radius you choose if you're following along. Next, to make our now blurry image more glowy, we need to go back to the filters menu, but this time select apply image. We'll select use current layer as source and change the blend mode to multiply. Now, this is where the magic happens. Changing our blend mode of the layer to screen, the complete opposite blend mode of multiplier, we're left with a nice but very intense glow over the entire image. Lowering the layer's opacity to around 30% I find to be the strongest I would typically go with this effect. A quick toggle of this layer's visibility gives you an idea of exactly what we've achieved here. An alternative method, if you're just looking to soften some harsh details in your image and not introduce any glow, would be to apply the Gaussian blur and just straight up lower its opacity without the need 
for the apply image filter or changing any blend modes. This is completely up to your taste and typically depends on the image itself. For a scene with this much intensity and dynamic light, the first method works quite well. And finally, the step I typically leave as the last effect is the vignette, or darkening of the edges. I do this to help keep the viewer's attention towards the center of the image. The brighter a pixel is, the more attention it will demand, so keeping the edges dark will help keep the central ambulance as the focus. Firstly, select the freehand selection tool and draw a shape around the areas you want to keep at their existing brightness. Keep it somewhat organic looking and consider the existing shapes in your composition while creating this selection. Once you've closed the selection, hit Command Shift I to invert the selection, create a curves adjustment layer, uh, the selection will automatically be applied as a mask, and lower the white point and midtones of the curve to taste. At this stage, it obviously doesn't look too convincing. Hit Command D to deselect what is currently selected. Head up to Filters, Blur, and Gaussian Blur one more time, and ramp up the radius a fair amount. Again, this will depend on the resolution of your image and your desired final result. The radius slider in this dialog box only allows you to go to 100 pixels. In order to bypass this restriction and go higher, just click and drag on your image. I think somewhere around 400 pixels works for this scene. Also, depending on how much you darken the curve will dictate how much you'll probably want to blur the mask for more gradual transitions. Okay, I lied. Sometimes my final step is adding a vignette, and sometimes I like to add a little bit of creative warping to the image. Basically, I'm just going to loosely sculpt the landscape to help make the composition a little more cohesive and flowy, if you will. To do this, we'll need to create another merge visible layer. That shortcut, once again, is Command Option Shift E. Get used to that shortcut because it's probably one of the most used shortcuts and could certainly be one of yours too. With our new merge layer selected, we need to activate the Mesh Warp tool located at the bottom of the toolbar. Now we can pull and manipulate the shape of the entire layer, taking care not to warp it to a point where it looks stupid or unrealistic. I also want to try and keep the top two thirds of the image relatively unaffected, so I'll have to push some areas back into shape. This step can take some fiddling to get the desired result. Keep in mind, uh, this final step is kind of a bonus step as it's not something I do too often to my images and a lot of landscape photography purists would probably hang me for this. Uh, but don't ever forget that photography is your art and a huge part of that art lies within the editing process. So do what you want and don't worry about what other people say. And there you have it guys, the final result. A very simple edit in terms of time and layer density, but with a brief introduction to some more advanced techniques. If I hold Alt and select our original layers thumbnail, I can show the before and after of this image. With just a few adjustments and effects, I think we've come a long way from where we started. That's all from me guys. Thanks so much for watching. If you have any questions, I'll be here in the chat for a while to answer them and help you with any problems you may be having, um, as long as it's somewhat related to this video. Thanks again, bye.